All right, thank you so much for your patience and welcome to the NRI session on community-driven governance for safe AI. My name is Jennifer Chung. I'll be your moderator for this session. Uh, I wear a few hats in this space, but for this hat, I am uh, representing the Secretariat of the Asia Pacific Regional IGF. We have a lot of very interesting viewpoints from across the national, regional, sub-regional, and youth IGF initiatives, and they are going to share with you, especially on the different developments, uh, the topics, the issues, and all of the policy recommendations that come out from their meetings. The NRI network is a very strong network of 160 plus, and I think still increasing. And we also, hopefully uh, people in the audience, if you would like to join the Zoom room, you'll also see our NRI colleagues who will be giving their interventions and discussions also uh, remotely. Not everyone is here in Kyoto with us, but of course this is the Internet Governance Forum, so it is a very good hybrid opportunity for everyone to be able to participate well. Speaking about artificial intelligence, this morning during the opening ceremony, we heard from the Prime Minister of Japan, Kishida-san, about the importance of uh, AI, and he unveiled the plans of the G7 to actually draw up a code of conduct for developers of generative AI. And we also heard from the welcome remarks from Secretary General Antonio Guterres about the establishment of the high-level advisory body on artificial intelligence. With all of this as a backdrop, and also indeed during this very jam-packed schedule of this IGF, you will be noticing an increase of a lot of the sessions that touch upon AI, emerging technology, and specifically on the governance and the safe governance and appropriate governance of this emerging technology. Um, when we're talking about uh, national, regional, sub-regional, and youth initiatives, each of them have different topics that are, are, are important in their respective jurisdictions and home regions. And it is really important to remember that it is, AI really holds a immense importance for our societal development and offers a lot of transformative opportunities across various sectors. AI has a potential to enhance efficiency, uh, productivity, and innovation, and drive a lot of economic growth and address a lot of challenges we have in the society. Um, from healthcare, of course, coming out of pandemic, uh, from education to transport and energy, this emerging tech can really revolutionize the processes and improve a lot of decision making. But amidst all of this, really good things that AI can bring us. We always have to remember that there are harms and we definitely need good governance to be able to leverage its actual benefits uh, to humanity. So talking about safe AI, we need policies, we need appropriate regulations and ethical frameworks to guide the development of this. We need to ensure accountability, transparency, and fairness in the design the deployment and use of AI systems. So what is effective governance and what, what, how can we promote responsible AI development? Um, so I'm very happy to be able to introduce to you um, the panel of speakers that we have to share with you the different uh, um, learnings and discussions from pretty much around the globe. Um, online, we have with us Ms. Pamela Chogo, from Tanzania IGF, and she'll be also presenting online. We have yet another online speaker. Um, apologies if I get your name pronounced wrong. It is Jeanne Erg Erguth from Germany, and he will be presenting the good discussions and the policy recommendations that came out of Eurodig. We also have Victor Lopez Cabrera, and he will be giving us a flavor from the discussions that were had in Panama IGF. Um, also online, we have Umut Pajaro Velasquez, and he will be presenting on the good discussions that were had in Youth LAC IGF, as well as Youth Columbia IGF, which will be having its uh, meeting later on this year. So enough of the, dis uh, of the um, 
recommendations and the introductions of the speakers online. And here on the panel we, ha we have with us um, on the far end, we have Ms. Uh, Tanara Lauschner. She will be talking about the developments in Brazil and she will be representing Brazilian IGF. And right next to me, we have Kamesh, and he is actually an ISOC ambassador for the IGF, so another youth uh, representative and delegate, and he will be presenting the viewpoints from India IGF as well. So I really want to start off with um, our speaker on stage, if that is okay. And then I will turn to our remote uh, uh, speakers as well online. But first, I really want to ask um, um, Ms. Tanara, in terms of Brazil and the developments there, um, what is the, the, the crucial points of discussion? Where are the pain points? Where are the recommendations coming from? And what is the most important issues right now facing, I guess, the Brazilian community and also the LAC region? Ms. Tanara. Thank you, Jennifer. Hello, everyone. First of all, I would like to thank the IGF Secretariat for organizing this session. And I would also like to thank the host country, Japan, and the local Kyoto team. It's my first time here, and I am excited to learn more about the country. As the coordinator of the, coordinator of the Brazilian IGF, I'm keenly aware of the challenges that all teams involved face it in carrying out this event. Congratulations, everything, everything has been executed perfectly. I will try to address both questions, but I will definitely touch as well on other topics of the sessions. Regarding the theme of the session, AI should be recognized as an emergent technology with the genuine potential to transform various social dynamics. For example, concerning scientific discovery, we are on the cusp of a pivotal shift in the trajectory of scientific exploration. As the world delves deeper into the digital era, our collective resulted, our collective scientific understanding and discourse are evolving concurrently. This evolution has resulted in an over overwhelming volume of data, providing exciting opportunities for computational platforms. The convergence of this societal and technological trend suggests that artificial intelligence will bring a significant transformation. By why? Recently, large language models have demonstrated outstanding capabilities in generating novel content and integrating ideas. They show potential in thinking, not just with language, but in logical structures based on code, suggesting they might generate innovate, innovative concepts by merging and connecting diverse ideas. However, the strong abilities of large language, mod, large language models compared with challenges concerning interpretability and control these models, the black boxes, can manifest unintended behaviors, biases, and their decisions frequently lack transparent, transparent explanations. In 2020, Brazil established the Brazilian Artif Artificial Intelligence Strategy under the Ministry of Science, Technolo Technology, and Innovations. The, the objective is fostering innovation bolstering economic competitiveness, and improving the quality of life for its citizens, always with an ethical and responsi responsible lens. As a multi-stakeholder stakeholder committee since 1995, CGI.br has collected valuable insights throughout this journey. A multi-stakeholder multi approach is a set of established practices wrote it in the belief that all stakeholders should collaboratively discuss, share ideas, and forge consensus policies. It's a challenge endeavor, but in the same way, the AI policy should be driven by multi-stakeholder discussions while also ensuring the preservation of fundamental rights. 
This multi-stakeholder model can further enhance international cooperation for ethical AI governance. CGI.PR is conducting the establishment of an artificial intelligence observato observatory in Brazil. This initiative aims to chart AI governance strategies and regulations, coordinate the development of open data sets for machine learning, training specific to Brazil, and elaborate indicators to track AI research, development, and applications in the country. This observatory is still under construction, and we hope it can contribute to AI research in the internet governance community. Um, we must not forget the main characteristics that led the evolution of the internet throughout its history, innovation. The internet and the digital ecosystem must be preserved and leveraged as a key catalytic for innovation as the basis for development addressing past, present, and future concerns and technologies, emerging technologies such as artificial intelligence, and so on. In order to, to extract benefits for people and drive the development of our world with responsibility, fairness, equality, and opportunities for all. All these aspects are also key when looking ahead to the Global Digital Compact by also to bear in mind the importance of the digital agenda to fulfill, fulfill the sustainable development goals. For now, uh, this concludes my inputs. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you, Tanara. A lot of very good developments, especially led by CGIBR, and a lot of like interesting discussions also that uh, illustrate the very complex landscape right now that the Brazilian community is talking about. Um, I would like to stay in the LAC region, and that's one of the actually highlights of the NRI networks. We are really uh, spread all over the globe. I'd like now to turn to one of our remote presenters, uh, Victor. Victor, who will give us a little bit of, uh, I guess, the developments covering an emphasis on AI and health and education. Victor, if you're able to take the mic, the floor is yours. Thanks so much. I really appreciate the invitation, and I thank IGF, IGF uh, Secretary for inviting us to be presenting our short ideas about these topics. While every sustainable development goal holds significance, my emphasis is on enhancing healthcare and endorsing quality of education because they are the pillars of so, uh, social development. And in that, in that regard, by 2053, Latin America is predicted to evolve into an aging society where those age 60 and above will surpass other age groups in sheer numbers. AI possesses the potential to bolster the silver economy crafting products and services tailored for the elderly. Ensuring the health and well-being of seniors is crucial, given the limited human resources sometimes we have. AI-driven automation emerges as a valuable ally. While AI's healthcare benefits extend to all citizens, our present, our present focus zeroes on the elderly, especially in this demographic growth rapidly. All sectors, from government to private enterprises, must collaborate on solutions. Recently in Panama, hosted the Ibero-American Forum on the Silver Economy. The event facilitated discussions on digitizing health services with AI and enhancing tech illiteracy among seniors. A standout pilot project features seniors actively working alongside young, younger tech aides epitomize the spirit of intergenerational learning. Both groups collaboratively explore tech usage and hone interpersonal skills. Our inspiration is to test telehealth tech tailored for tech-savvy seniors. Through co-creation, seniors have realized the vital role of technology in their daily lives, particularly in activities they hold dear. Simultaneously, the younger generation, age 17 to 21, experienced firsthand the value of human-centered tech deployment, gaining insights into the troves of wisdom seniors possess. 
This collaboration is spawning new intergenerational initiatives. Furthermore, the inception of AI in education isn't recent. It began with the advent of intelligent tutoring systems some decades ago, predated even sophisticated models like ChatGPT or any other LLM. I was there, I've been 40 years seeing this development. AI's educational journey has witnessed varied outcomes over the years. Moreover, this week, the Latin American Parliament, which is a body of this, uh, decision makers headquarters in Panama, has championed the establishment of the Office of the Future. Its mandate is to anticipate technological shifts and prepare for them collectively. Ethical AI discussions dominate its agenda. In testament to this commitment, a pan Latin American Assembly will convene in Panama later this year, focusing on collaborative and ethical AI deployment. Now, there are some concerns, of course, because AI has its pros and cons. Independently of the AI variant is used, because AI is a set of different methodologies, it's not one AI, LLM is only one of them, data remains paramount. In our age of data privacy, informed and arguably enlightened consent becomes essential. The challenge lies in ensuring citizens have the AI literacy now, not only digital literacy, but AI literacy to discern when to share data and when to abstain. Trust lies at the heart of this dynamic, necessitating trust certified system. AI is multifaceted with its applications and methodologies continually evolving. Keeping abreast of such rapid shift is daunting. Therefore, I congratulate Brazil for the observatory they are building because it's gonna be key for our region. It's imperative that AI doesn't erode quintessential human skills like empathy, interaction with AI, regardless of its sophistication, doesn't replace genuine human connections. So we must, we must be careful with the use of AI, but we, we cannot hinder development. Thank you. Thank you very much, Victor, and thank you also for reminding us really the importance of the multi-stakeholder participation both in the process of designing how AI should be and the governance, and also in how AI should be used. And there is a very fine nuance there and that it's very important nuance that we need to take. And also reminding us that you know data is paramount when we're looking at emerging technologies. It is a set of technologies that do then, of course, very quickly manipulate all the, da the data that we have. I'd like to stay in Latin America and go to another remote uh, presenter, Umut and he will be giving us the outcomes from the youth lack IGF, as well as his own expertise on AI. Amut, if you're able to, the floor is yours. Uh, hello, everyone. Uh, well, as Jennifer will say, I will be presenting mainly the outputs from the youth lack IGF that occurred this year in ECOS, uh, related to AI and emerging technologies. This is a summarized version of what the people presented during the, the three days of discussions. And it, for me, it's a quiet demonstration or a comprehensive or, or a comprehensive of the multifaceted challenge that and prospect that AI and emerging technology has. The main thing that we discussed here was the global inclusivity in, in AI governance. Specifically, it was reiterated that AI governance should be transcend geographical boundaries and not be monopolized by the global north. Because, create, because if we want to create a resilient framework and promote meaningful partnerships, require the incorporation of perspectives and traits from the global south because the majority of the world, because the majority of the world lives in the global south. Uh, this is a way to ensure the development and regulation of AI technologies consider the, the, the diversity of needs and contents of these nations. Also was emphasized the critical integration of human rights approach into each phase of the AI's life cycle. This entails uh, 
uh, emphasizing the rights of underrepresenting and marginalized communities, such as Black, Indigenous, uh, indigenous people, people of color, of color, LGBTQI plus communities, women and children. Uh, it was considered that by, by prioritizing these rights, AI technologies will have the potential to empower and uplift these vulnerable, vulnerable groups and no harm them as is happening right now, especially in, in some social media platform or another representations that AI, the generative AI is having. Uh, also, it was a consensus amongst the different stakeholders that were part of the, of the conversation during the Yoga KGF that AI regulation uh, should oversize and not should, should, be, should not be sole responsibility of governments, private sector, or academia acting independently. Uh, because true progress in this aspect necess necessitates a cooperative effort among all the stakeholders engaged in the designing, developing, implementing, and, and use of this technology. Because only through collective action can we effectively tackle the multiple challenges that AI, AI, AI is presented to us. Also, some participants uh, express their concern regarding the multiple dangers of a generative AI. We emphasis in this information and the face and may have severe, and how this can have, may, can have severe repercussions, particularly in political, in political campaigns. Uh, here in Latin America, the class kind of strategy are used a lot. So the call was to implement a strategy that to mitigate risk should be, that should be essential uh, element of AI governance frameworks. That means that not only this could, should be a responsibility, a responsibility for the governments, but also for the private sector to tackle this, this kind of risks, the, the kind of risks, in order, to pre, in order to preserve the integrity, not only on the information, but also the, all the democratic processes. Also, it was highlighted the environmental impact of AI and emerging technologies, emphasizing the necessity of addressing the consequences of widespread AI implementation. Moreover, it is so crucial that the advancement of, the, of this technology total increase the digital device, particularly in rural regions and among indigenous populations. It is necessary to consider language barrier and cultural sensitivity, sensitivities to guarantee that these technologies are comprehensive and um, are made for everyone. This implies to have a universal acceptance from the design stage of these technologies. Finally, uh, was also addressed the need to review and strengthen the data protection rules, uh, not only for AI technologies, but also for the future development of social and quantum computing because data plays a central role in on internet and in internet governance. So robust safeguards are essential to secure, to secure not only privacy, but also a more secure uh, evolving technological landscape as it is internet. Uh, and, and that was in general all the, all the outcomes that came from the Jula KGF this year, so thank you. Thank you, Umut. That was a very wide ranging and very fulsome output that the youth like IGF has um, discussed, all the way ranging from ethical guidelines, regulatory frameworks, to even the environment, and also really bring it back to the most important part, it has to be human centric. 
So now I want to move from Latin America, the Gulag region, all the way back to our region that we are in right now, which is Asia Pacific, and specifically India. So Kamesh, can you tell me a bit about, since I know that your day job is also particularly looking at um, these policies, especially with the policies in AI, how can the development, design, deployment, and auditing of AI to be shaped to prioritize these ethical considerations? Um, thanks for that question, Jennifer. Um, and like some great points have come out from like, you know, diverse regions. I try to not repeat myself and like, you know, try to give some unique perspective here. Um, I'll, I'll come to India part uh, towards the end of my intervention. I had like some three points to add here. Um, starting with like, you know, very well, like, you know, articulated question, I must say in terms of like the development, deployment and like, you know, auditing. So here, I guess like, um, just, just coming from the status quo itself, like we all know that like there are various frameworks available out there, which talks about different principles. Um, and like what should be done and etc and stuff at different stages. But um, you know one aspect that is very important as we move forward um, thinking about um, how can we make AI technology utilization more uh, responsible is to like think a little bit from uh, like the intervention perspective itself from an ecosystem perspective where, where we do see that like you know uh, when you talk about designing at the designing level, there are like key stakeholders are involved, right? Like which talks, starts from like technology companies themselves. And then comes to AI developers. And AI developers are not necessarily the people who are actually deploying such technologies. And then when it comes to deployment stage, there are like AI deployers. And also you have like people like, um, you know, who actually like in the ground deploy. If I could give an example, you started with healthcare. Within healthcare, like maybe there's some technology company who's actually like, you know, developing a te health technology using, uh, which, which is like emphasized on AI. And that might be bought or like, you know, brought by the hospitals. And ultimately it has been like, you know, uh, operational lawyers are used by doctors or uh, healthcare professionals. So. Across this chain, if you see, there are various, you know, stakeholders involved and everybody has responsibilities to add towards like ensuring at the ecosystem level when the AI is used, it has to be used responsibly. So figuring out those nuances is what like I think is the way forward um, in terms of like making this technological use way better. Nobody's denying that like, you know, the technology brings out the most positive outcomes in most of the critical sectors. So just to make it even more work better, I guess like, you know, looking at it from the ecosystem perspective is important. The second point I wanted to talk about is that like some of the principles that are already available, right? Like the human-centered AI principles, trustworthy AI, or explainability and et cetera and et cetera. So here, I guess like some to an extent we are seeing consensus across the globe, right? Like, or within the domestic, you know, paradigms. Um, there, there is a consensus in what are the principles we really striving towards, like, you know, the utilization of AI, or like the way it has to be designed and like deployed and etc. But like, I guess like a little bit more nuance, I guess like this does a little bit of this work, is nuance is needed in terms of operationalization. Um, aspect, which I guess like has to like, you know, kickstart a little bit more when we talk about like, you know, if I could get a, give an example, we, we talk a lot about principles like human in the loop, right? But that principle when it comes to operationalization across the AI life cycle, they mean differently. So we need to bring such differences out and for different stakeholders, as I was mentioning in my previous point, also means differently. If I could give an instance, hum human in the loop as a principle, maybe at the planning stage might mean that you have to engage with stakeholders or like, you know, bring in the people who will be impacted by this. But at the same thing, when it comes to operationalization or in the actual operationalization stage, at that moment, maybe you need to have a human who's actually also supervising whatever is like, you know, put out there. So we need to bring such nuances out and such that like, you know, it easily can be picked up whoever is like, you know, they're developing or deploying the technology to understand their responsibilities and use it safely. Now coming to like my final point in terms of like, you know, where is like, you know, what is India doing and, you know, and everything and stuff. 
like any other nation like as obviously like you know india is also looking upon like you know how can we make this technology um uh, utilization to the max but here the nuance here is like i guess like victor also pointed out a little bit is that how can we balance this with innovation right like ai is a cut through innovation and that's going to you know pick up the you know at least the global south in terms of like how they are going to like you know excel in the future so you know we need to find that balance and that's what like you know india's like you know uh, does it and they did a very good job there in the digital personal data protection act which came out like very recently where we try to like look two different aspects which is both like you know how to use the value of data as well as like you know protecting the privacy so similarly something is happening within the ai ecosystem as well second point here within the sub point within this itself is that like we all know that india is the chair for gpai this year so one of the you know key aspect which has been like our minister has been also putting it out is that what could be a well thought through regulatory framework or let, let's take it and when we talk about regulatory framework there's also a connotation regulatory framework means compliance and like that's going to come from the government but the regulatory framework can be anything right like it can be also a market enabling mechanisms that the government might be thinking about so that is something that the you know the the uh, it's going to be one of the themes which has been like you know suggested through the gpai that india will be sharing um and um, also like there i guess like like one key aspect any of this forums or like any bilateral or multilateral forum should be striving towards this consensus building because like at this moment everybody is doing something or the other when it comes to like you know regulatory aspects and principles and etc but like one aspect that, that like we see consistently is principles so we need to hold to that point and try to see like that can be a conversation starter at the global level for us to like have a conversation that like okay you also talk about this principle i also talk about this principle can we come together so i guess that is what is like key uh, you know importance and i think like that's also something that we we might be seeing in the gpi this year happening so i'll stop there and i can come in later really really appreciate Kamesh you bringing in in the flavor and nuance especially with India becoming the chair of the G uh, GPAI later on this year and I'm going to abuse my hat as a moderator just very briefly just to kind of add to the context from Asia Pacific uh, since my hat as a uh, you know the secretary of the APR HGF, this year too we had discussions on the contours of AI regulation and I think I want to highlight and pick up on one of the points you said there are so many different regulatory frameworks and everybody is trying right now very quickly to develop good practices and best practices. I think the most important part is that this is somehow coordinated and somehow not so much harmonized in the fact that we are actually leveraging and not redoing and reinventing the wheel as we move forward together. So cannot stress enough the importance of multi-stakeholder collaboration. Just echoing what the SG said this morning, you know, having a high-level body to, to look oversee this thing, as well as some very uh, important and strategic collaboration, both within the Asia-Pacific region and to all the regions around the globe. Enough about Asia for now. I would like to now move over to the Africa region, and we're going to be moving over to another online speaker, um, Pamela Chogo, if you are able to, we would love to hear a little bit more about the good discussions that came out of Tanzania and I guess in general also from the Africa region. Uh, Pamela, the floor is yours. Yes, can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you, Pamela. Yeah, okay, thank you. Uh, as mentioned, my name is Pamela. From Tanzania. I'm a researcher and a lecturer um, working so much around uh, natural language processing. So from our side, um, we had a long discussion during our idea in line with uh, AI and uh, what is happening because um, so far we are enjoying the benefits, but at the same time uh, we see a lot of challenges around. So in our context, uh, unfortunately, we are also still working on, the, on uh, filling up the digital gap. So we see that uh, technology is moving so fast when you're trying to fill up the digital gap, but then now we have to be talking about AI. 
And uh, uh, there is a bit of scare because the level of understanding of AI is still very low. Uh, those in the digital space, some of the developers uh, are not much aware of, of how to develop AI solutions. But also when you come to the users, we have users who are using uh, AI, but uh, some of them, or many of them, are using it unknowingly. We don't even know that they're using AI. But on the other side, we also have the community at large, which is also contributing towards AI, but they don't really know or they don't really understand that in their daily activities, they are contributing to AI. So this calls up a, a long discussion and uh, we see that there's a great need for increasing awareness on AI because uh, <clears throat> many see AI as a technical aspect, but uh, uh, looking at AI, it is basically a social technical aspect and it really needs, really needs to be looked upon on the both sides. So on our side, we suggest that there's a great uh, need for AI advocacy and awareness so that people can understand more. And here it will help us ensure there's fairness, uh, there is explainability, there's robustness, transparency, and also data privacy is um, taken into consideration. So we need to look at all aspects from the people, people side, like um, uh, their general understanding of AI, but as the other speaker mentioned, considering other aspects such as culture, diversity, background in developing and the use of AI. But we also have to, to look at the process of developing the AI. For instance, uh, when you talk of AI, you talk about data. So how are we gathering the data? Here it comes to the, the issue of consent during data collection. But it also comes into the data collection process. How ethically are we doing this? But also the technical tools a great understanding is needed on the models, the frameworks that are in place. And um, the developers should be in a position to share with us, be transparent, and tell us the models that are, they are using, the frameworks that they are using, and if possible, the use, reusability of these frameworks and uh, models should be easily done. So as I mentioned, uh, we emphasize on awareness creation, um, and it should consider or start with the policy makers, developers, users, and the community at large. Ethics in data collection should be ensured, uh, validity and accuracy. And here I can share a bit of my experience as I started working with NLP. I actually did not get a straight line towards how should I go with the data collection process. So I had to read several documents to find the right path that would be ethical. So if we have something that can guide all of us, that we can all follow, then it would make the process more smooth. Uh, but also, what are the standards? For instance, when you train the model, you have the aspect of accuracy. So what would be the best standard? Is it 95%, 98%? And what happens to that 5% or 2% that we have this model? So maybe it might have effects in one way or another. So I'm happy that um, you briefly mentioned about what was discussed in the opening session, and you mentioned something about the code of conduct, and I am so happy to hear that, because uh, for me, I, my main suggestion was uh, the world is now, should now look at AI as the way we look at environment, and let's say the way we look at climate change, and maybe come up with a, an AI convention where everybody would have to adhere are there too. And it doesn't matter if you are in which part of the world, you have to align and follow. And I think this will create a safe space where we can all enjoy uh, the benefits of AI without affecting anyone. Thank you. So that's my contribution for now. Thank you so much, Pamela. And thank you for also highlighting the importance of the different levels of development and awareness around artificial intelligence. We need to have, as Umut has already talked about, um, AI literacy. In addition to digital literacy and all of that, AI literacy is also extremely important. The capacity building around that and awareness uh, around that is very important because AI, in, in, at, the, at the heart of it, is a tool for us to improve our human societies and how we 
learn to use this tool, how we are aware of when we can deploy this tool is extremely important. I want to wrap this uh, first um, kind of uh, opening remarks from speakers and, and end in, in the European region. And really, uh, for Jern, I'd like to ask a little bit more, because I know Eurodic talked quite a lot about AI and emerging technologies, but specifically on how the IGF and the Global Digital Compact uh, look, are looking at this in particular. And I know, Jern, you also have some slides. And if you would like to share those, your floor is, uh, floor is yours. Thank you. Thank you very much. <clears throat> so I'm a um, juridic subject matter expert for human rights and privacy and also affiliated with the <coughs> University of Geneva. And um, the Eurodic has participated in the UN Secretary General <coughs> Global Digital Compact uh, process uh, and has submitted one chapter on AI that you see here. <coughs> and we have mentioned um, all the issues, transparency, explainability, discrimination, uh, human-centered AI, data governance, data protection, and, and privacy, data sources that are all around trust. And the sad truth is that we, some, at least some of them, cannot be achieved with the current technology. We cannot um, uh, have transparency, explainability. Um, uh, we, we don't know whether systems will discriminate or... <clears throat> <coughs> sorry. Um, and uh, we have uh, still uh, data protection issues. So these <coughs> things um, well, have to be dealt with or <coughs> have to be solved in some way, but we cannot just say, well, <coughs> let's do some regulation and then we will have it. Um, Interestingly, the EU, uh, when the EU uh, started to uh, re uh, draft the regulatory framework for AI in 2021, they were not aware of uh, uh, large language models like ChatGPT. <clears throat> and when they became aware, <clears throat> they quite, quite a lot changed the already drafted AI Act. <clears throat> and this means that we have to be aware that new applications, new technology uh, advances will change <clears throat> how we need to regulate. And um, particularly also applications will need, <clears throat> will require change there. So um, we see that we should agree on a global set of core principles, like that humans should ultimately remain in control, have oversight, and should remain responsible. <clears throat> and I agree, uh, of course, with, with uh, Umut that there is room for interpre interpretation there, <clears throat> and that we, we need to have a flexible model uh, to act on new technological developments and applications. <clears throat> the multi-stakeholder approach and cross-regional dialogue are key for ensuring harmonization and offer support for cross-border use cases. Since some regions and state might also have different concerns, different attitudes and culture, policymakers should be able to adapt quickly <clears throat> to these general, um, these general pr principles through concrete instruments to their own situation. So one <clears throat> rule that is carved in stone and uh, is valid for everybody will not <clears throat> solve it. So we, we need to have a flexible tool. <clears throat> and for example, when you look at education, I think um, um, Eurotech has, has had, had a session on AI in education, LLMs in education, <clears throat> and we see children are amongst the most vulnerable population. But children will also be required to use new technology in the future. It doesn't make sense to teach them the skills that were required in the past. They need to <clears throat> work with new tools. Students need to be able to study AI. Research is essential and should not be restricted by regulation. Investment in educational programs and raising awareness is needed to help users understand AI technology. To understand the benefits of this technology as well as the risk of this technology. <clears throat> Neighboring technology like robotics, IoT, as well as future technology like quantum computing also need to be taken into account when they become available. <clears throat> Current ongoing 
regional and global initiatives on collaboration and information sharing should be supported. So <clears throat> it is, as was said already before, the multi-stakeholder approach here is very important and should not be replaced by one uniform regulation <clears throat> that everybody uh, ad has to adhere to uh, in the same way. We need to continue with the multi-stakeholder approach, particularly because technology is changing fast and <clears throat> is revolving. So I don't want to speak too long, thank you, and I will uh, be looking forward to, to the further discussion. Thank you so much, John. I think Eurodig did a very comprehensive discussion, uh, uh, especially on the implications of, of AI. And I think, I think we can all agree that having core principles when we're looking forward to creating a regulatory framework or any kind of framework is extremely important. And you've also jumped ahead to, to our, our discussion, hopefully, that we'll have right now with the audience in the floor and online about how the NRIs can commit to actions. And I think, you know, Eurodig would should be sharing this already. <laughs> Uh, have probably have shared this already to the NRI network, but this is something that we can probably build on uh, uh, um, and, and, and actually uh, implement as well, I think. So now I'd like to open the floor to any questions we have. I already know that there is a question from the Bangladesh Remote Hub that they'd like to take the floor. But anybody in the audience, if you do have a question, I think we're able to... I'm not sure if there's any roaming mics around or if there's a mic. I think I see a mic stand over there. So I think perhaps if you do have any questions or any suggestions or if you want to also share your perspective from your region or your jurisdiction, I think that would be very helpful. So first, I'd like to see if we can give the mic to um, the Bangladesh Remote Hub, if you will allow them to unmute themselves and ask their question. If you're able to give Bangladesh Remote Hub co-host rights so they can unmute. Thank you. Thank you, respected moderator, Ms. Jennifer Chang, for giving me such golden opportunity to place my question in this important forum. I am Shainara Bego from Bangladesh, working as an individual consultant in the center. Uh, today's uh, topic is very important, artificial in intelligence, which is a field uh, combined with computer science and uh, robust data sets for problem sol solving. But it could be, uh, I think it could be very strong instrument to uh, cross the boundary for learning and uh, doing our uh, daily basis for very quickly and hassle. But my question is that in the developing countries, in the context of our social economic status and uh, uh, other scenarios, most of the people are far behind from the internet connectivity and the electronic devices. In this context, how we can be benefited uh, from these uh, uh, services that means uh, avail the uh, artificial intelligence services. Thank you. Thank you. So my dear, another participant is having a question. Can you hear? Uh, okay, from the same room. Yes, mm -hmm. you can ask your question as well. Please go ahead. My name is Yansan Babsha, I'm chair of the Bangladesh Media Asia. My question is the good century. How we can use artificial intelligence in education for reskilling and upskilling for music in a developing country? Thank you. Uh, I'm so sorry. The second question was not quite audible. If you could either repeat the question or type it in chat, I'll be happy can to you, read can, it. Can, out. You hear me, dear can you hear me right now? Yes, we can hear you. Yes, I am repeating my questions. From my question is totally youth centric. That is how we can use artificial intelligence in education for reskilling and upskilling. 
for youths in the developing country. So we're also Thank relying you. on the captioners to capture the question. I think it said how we can um, leverage artificial intelligence in agriculture in developing countries. I'm just, con yes. and, and education as well, right? Just confirming that is your question. Okay. Um, how artificial intelligence can uh, emulate uh, their uh, opportunity to reskilling and upskilling for youths in the Obs developing countries? Got it. Now we hear, yes, upskilling for youth. So there's the two questions from Bangladesh Remote Hub. One is regarding, you know, if the developing countries there are citizens who are still, uh, there are issues about connectivity. How can they leverage and, and benefit from artificial intelligence? The second one is regarding the upskilling of youth in, in this respect. I see somebody in the line. So we'll take this question and then we'll go to the panelists. Please go ahead. Yeah. Thank you, Jennifer Ponslick from Gambia NRI. Uh, my question, um, I want to reference my colleague from India in regards to use of generative AI and um, data governance. How do you think at a local level with uh, our national NRIs, we can be able to use that to impact the growth of digital governance in our respective countries? Thank you. Thank you, Ponslet. So. Do we have any panelists who wants to answer the first two questions? If not, I think I'll go directly to Kamesh to answer the third one since it was directed to you, and then we can go backwards to the other two questions. Kamesh? Uh, thank you so much. Uh, I didn't quite catch his name, but... Uh, Ponce it. Yeah, uh, thank you so much for that question. And um, I guess data governance is very close to me. And um, yeah, so um, like that's a very interesting question because like, you know, sometimes we think these tech, uh, you know, legislations are only catering to specific kinds of technologies, but they might not. Um, how the, you know, um, a legislation like uh, Digital Personal Data Protection Act 2023, uh, which is very, very new for India, which we just got in past, um, is going to be applied for uh, within the AI technologies is also from, I can't give much experiences from India because like we just have an act and like we will be going forward and like, you know, we will be seeing it. But one aspect which has been like, you know, specifically like important when we talk about data governance and uh, artificial intelligence is like how way forward can we use publicly available personal information. So that is a very key aspect and like that's also something that we have to be like, you know, talking about because at this moment, whatever the innovations or technologies that AI, um, uh, any, any algorithms behind AI is to like, you know, scrape data which is available out there to provide the service. But like how the, such technologies can be seen, uh, you know, used um, um, a yeah, uh, way forward with the data protection regulation in a place is something we have to look. So another aspect, like as you were asking about some learnings, like as I said, like in India, we still have to learn. But um, uh, one learning from, at least from globally, is that like is consent used as an artifact for, you know, um, um, uh, utilization of like, or processing of the data. So I guess like with emerging technologies like artificial intelligence and IOTs and et cetera, I think like there's a crucial question for us to answer right now is like, is consent the way forward, right? So we need to also start thinking like, you know, as we move forward and as the technologies are like evolving and emerging, we need to also figure out some new ways in which like we can safeguard our data where I guess like, you know, certainly like consent like or like any other older mechanisms, obviously there is merits to them, but like we also have to evolve and have more options because like I can't really see, you know, uh, such a, you know, uh, artifact can be applied in a, a generative AI kind of a situation, right? So I guess that's one learning for any new um, jurisdictions moving towards the data protection regulations to consider more um, innovations within regulations, which could actually also work in tandem with the innovations that are happening in technologies. So that's my answer and I hope that helps. Thank you.
Um, let, let me try to answer the, the first and the second uh, questions. Um, I think uh, offline AI applications can be utilize, utilized, such as language translation tools and health diagnostic apps that function without continuous online access. Uh, but it, it is difficult to imagine how uh, people that don't have connection and don't have uh, uh, don't have money to to assess this kind of of devices can can uh, improve their life with this with these solutions. But uh, in agriculture, the the I don't remember the name of the <laughs> the man that, that speak. I, I can enhance far, AI can enhance farming methods by predicting weather or potential threats with finding relied farmers during sporadic internet avail availability. Furthermore, community centers and remote areas might host AI driven services offering local residents insights from educational to health-related applications. Uh, Davin, even without consistent online access, AI's transformative potential can still be harnessed in diverse and impactful, impactful ways. Thank you. Thank you, Tanara. Um, that is extremely important when we're looking at developing countries about you know, what is the benefits when we're still looking at problems of access, when we're still looking pro at problems of connectivity, when we're still looking at problems of actually getting people online. How can they benefit from AI? I'd like to turn also to get a little bit of a response from Pamela as well, since she mentioned specifically from, from Tanzania the, 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 the um, need to have this capacity building and awareness because there are already uh, other issues and problems that are facing the community there. So Pamela, maybe a little bit of a response from you regarding that. Okay, thank you. Uh, yes, as I mentioned earlier, and I think as we all know, uh, most of African countries are still struggling with resources. But I see AI being of great benefit, uh, I would say, bringing up community solutions. So it might be difficult as an individual to access the certain service, but this service through AI can be beneficial in um, uh, a community uh, context, for instance, in, a, in health or in agriculture, you can have an AI solution that, let's say, can help in uh, prediction, uh, as mentioned, in agriculture, or can also be used in uh, health sector. Now, it is not important for an individual to have this device for AI to assist, but this device can be present in the hospital and hence can solve the problem of uh, lack of experts as well as uh, lack of other resources. For instance, in my test, in my studies, I am developing a chatbot to be used in agriculture, and the problem I am solving is lack of extension offices. So with this particular chatbot, it can be used in a community where they can access the information, they can access the knowledge collectively. So yes, we have challenges, but uh, I believe with what we already have, we can still get uh, benefits out of here. Thank you so much, Pamela. That is extremely important as well to keep in mind. Um, for the question about the upskilling for youth, if I could ask Umut to elaborate a little bit more specifically since you had some very good learnings coming out of youth like IGF. What should we do to upskill youth to you know, the dangers or the benefits or even just the general use and tools for, for AI and generative AI actually? Uh, Umut? Well, when it comes uh, to youth, uh, and well, as uh, was mentioned before, the, especially because in, if we are in 
in the global south in the global south countries we pretty much know uh, all of us had access to these technologies that's probably the part of the question was about also about that how we benefit from this kind of emerging economies when we are uh, when we uh, start to use AI technologies. So for me, mainly is to find ways to make it more access because AI can be like uh, uh, access in, in a way that can be more like engaging. Uh, also provide more uh, like a hands on experience to you so they can understand how the how the tools are, are being actually applied in the real life and how can they benefit from it and how they can actually enrich the processes and I don't know in the in in spaces like work, education and another like that. Because we know there are risks, but we can also know there are benefits. So we can should focus also on, uh, on that on that aspect of AI too. But for that, we know we need to know how to use the the, the different tools. And for to do it, to do it, we had to be with them in in our everyday life. Uh, also, to for some another way to uh, or skills uh, or abilities in AI is to reach with people that already manage these kind of tools, and learn from them. Uh, and also, finally, what I can say is uh, when we try to skill ourselves, it's better if we do it as a community because AI is a collaborative field and it's important to create this kind of community, especially when we are young, so, so we can like learn and help from each other. And we can do it in several ways, like, I don't know, online or probably just developing some kind of hackathons when you have several people with different expertise trying to and understand how a tool is being used or how you can improve that thing or that, that tool. So yeah, there's uh, several ways you can do that and benefit not only in the educational aspects, but also in other aspects in, the, in, the, in our lives. Thank you so much, Umut. I also want to pose these questions actually to Victor and John, if you wanted to respond on, on any specific questions that were asked regarding uh, either the upskilling of youth or the um, other question on how you know Global South and developing countries can actually benefit from AI. And this, besides the actual directed question over to Gamesh, but we'd like to hear from you too, if you'd like to um, intervene. Yes, please. If I may? Yes, please go ahead. Okay, <clears throat> there was a question about that data governance and data governance is not only uh, data protection, but uh, there is a specific data governance and the EU, for example, has passed a data Gov governance act. <clears throat> and when you look at, um, AI, it is important that um, there is no mono monopoly on the training data. And this has been addressed by the EU Data Governance Act. And of course, this is also in, uh, very uh, important for developing nations, for <clears throat> small and medium enterprises, for uh, startups, that there is no monopoly on the training data. And <clears throat> so, uh, big companies are requested to share data that can be used uh, for uh, training purposes. And also, <clears throat> when you look at uh, copyright, if the copyright is being extended, then this might be a, a barrier to using <clears throat> freely available data for training purposes. So it is um, very important to have an equal access to AI technology, that there is no monopoly on the data. <clears throat> and this does not, um, this is something that is besides, exists besides data protection. Data protection is about uh, personal data. <clears throat> and this training data does not have to be personal data, but it can be any kind of data that 
is necessary for training AI systems. And I think uh, it would be very important for the Global South that they too can access this data and that there are no barriers to access the data to train systems. Well, may I? Please go ahead, Victoria. Okay, I'm gonna address the last one and then go upwards. Uh, from having, you know, I think it's wonderful having data, uh, data, data, I mean, data sets available and not having a monopoly. The situation is that the global south has to provide data also in, in, so, that, so that the algorithms can actually model our specifics in our countries with our context. The, I, 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 I can pinpoint an example. I mean, uh, if you have like biomarkers for elderly, they are not the same ranges. If you are in Brazil, you are in Panama, probably will be the best, will be the same. But if you are in Europe or North America, the, the, the nutrition factors, the, the uh, culture will affect the ranges. Medical doctors have to decide how to do, for example, automatic telemonitoring of health for elderly. And we saw that problem because we were trying to do some some uh, out of, some diagnostics, and then the ranges were not exactly appropriate for people who were in the countryside doing agriculture, because they are not the same. You know, they, it's not the same body, not, not the same metabolism. So the South and the developing countries need to contribute more data in order so that the data sets are enriched and actually there's, there are no biases, more biases. That's one thing, and, 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 and I don't know what would be the best way to do that, but I, I know the need, because you need to do that so that the probabilistic uh, models of the, I mean, computations of the models can be adjusted. In terms of the digital divide, well, that's gonna be a really hard one. In my opinion, Panama has only four million people. It's a very tiny country, very small. You can go all over the place. And still we have a divide, especially after the pandemic. Uh, those who have not, do not have uh, devices, those who do, do have devices, but they do not have access to internet, and those who have none. And uh, it's, a, it's, a, it's a really, really nasty problem that um, governments and private sector, it's not a thing of governments, it's a society as a whole, has to establish a way to do that. Computationally, if I may say so, you might work with AI that is connectionless, which means that at some point you can do some work with AI at your cell phones, you know, those small tasks to do some diagnostics or something in the countryside, and whenever you get to a place where you can connect, then you update and then you can do some, some more work. So just working at the edge, you know, computing at the edge, trying to do some work over there, and then when you, con when you, con you connect, then do that. Uh, you have to work on communities. For example, in Panama, in the, in the indigenous people, the, the, actually, the Internet Society is working, establishing networks, community networks, so that they can have access to Internet. And then, along with that, will come telemonitoring, will come e-learning, will come the other, the other goodies. But it has to be a collective effort, and, some, and mo I've seen working at the community level. I mean, we have to be part of the solution, not part of the problem. And with the AI with for skilling and upskilling with my own students. They are in first year. I didn't teach them chat GPT. They learned chat GPT by themselves. I mean, by the time they came, they, I, I teach a student, freshman students, first year, first time at the university. They already knew that. But they didn't, they didn't get that at the school, which means there is a fresh mind that you just have to be a mentor. We need less professors and more mentors, people who actually share the, just the, 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 the learning experience and let them grow, of course, guiding them. And in terms of skilling, well, they learn, they, they are learning some, uh, they, they, I, I put them 
to work with the, with the elderly, and both were learning ChatGPT. Can you imagine a person from 85 years old learning ChatGPT from a 17 years old? The, the kind of dynamics that, it's, that you can get out of it. So the upskilling and reskilling is not only the technical capabilities, it's actually that you are getting how to be a better human being using technology to, learn, to teach another human being how to use technology. That's, that's my take on that. Thank you so much, Victor. I'd like to still you know, see if there's any more questions, both from the floor and also online. I'll give, oh, Nazar, if you're able to go over to the mic. Sorry, I came in late, uh, but I, I have a question which I think um, uh, ha would have a lot of interest to uh, the key players uh, in the industry. Um, <clears throat> what do you think, uh, uh, what are the considerations for um, regulation, not over-regulation, but regulations uh, because I know um, whether it is generative or the, uh, the other side of the uh, artificial intelligence, ultimately uh, each country would uh, uh, at some point, you know, make uh, regulations. And what as professions uh, in, in this field, what sort of um, considerations should uh, the policymakers do uh, when doing the uh, the regulation for the uh, the regulations um, uh, for the artificial intelligence, thank you so much. Thank you, Nazar. I actually do see two more questions from the Bangladesh Remote Hub. This is good. This is exactly when you should be asking the questions. I will read them out. The question one is. Most of the people in developing countries are far behind in internet connectivity and electronic devices. How can we benefit or enjoy AI services and facilities? I think this question was already answered. Oh, and the second one was also answered too. So actually, it's just Nazar's question. So I think both uh, Kamesh and Jern did touch on the regulatory framework. So if I could touch on both of you first to intervene, and then we'll go to the concluding remarks for the speakers. Kamesh? Yeah. Uh, thank you so much for that question. And um, um, I will also keep some points for the concluding remarks in terms of like, you know, what's the way forward. Uh, just like targetedly answering to that question is that is, um, any consideration at the regulatory level has to take into consideration the innovations and the positive angle that the you know the technology is bringing out. Uh, so, what kind of a regulatory lever are we moving towards in terms of like uh, um, taking any interventions? Has to consider that like you know that that is a it's like implementable in terms of like you know understanding the nuances of the emerging technologies and it has to be implementable. And B, it is that like it should not disrupt. So because like especially in the developing countries, like you know such an innovation like now becoming like trying to like solve a lot of your um, you know traditional problems in critical sectors. So let's actually like try to look at like you know one side like it's solving the problems, but in terms of like also making while it solves the problem, it should not create problems. So how can we make those checks and balances? At the balanced level is what, like you know, has to be you know done. But um, I'll I'll like come in and like you know in the concluding remarks more. Thank you, Kamesh um, and Jen. Your your take on the regulatory frameworks? Well, the, the approach the EU takes is a risk-based approach, meaning <clears throat> regulate harshly where there is high risk and regularly, uh, regulate almost uh, not where there is uh, no or almost no risk. Of course, this is difficult to assess what kind of risk is really involved, <clears throat> particularly when you see uh, systems like LLMs that can be used for fun with uh, no risk or for serious purposes with 
quite a considerable risk. So I'm not sure <clears throat> if this approach will be the best approach, but at least I think it's a, a reasonable approach to start with. Uh, so look at the risk, look, look at, uh, at the applications, and then <clears throat> regulate the applications using AI and not regulate the technology per se that can be used in quite different ways. All right, Jen, thank you so much. It is really important to also, you know, note that the EU specifically is more advanced in looking at the regulatory framework. So it is it is good to, to also see the comparison between the regions as well. Um, I'm not sure, uh, Victor, Pamela, or Mut, if you would like to also intervene on that regulatory framework question. If the answer is no, maybe if we can have a last call for any burning questions from the floor or online. I think the answer is no. So maybe if we can um, ask our speakers to really give us some, you know, what the NRIs can do, like the actions that we can take forward, or really just concluding remarks, what is the main takeaway you would like us to remember coming out of the session? If we can start uh, with Victor. Well, I think in, in NRIs and they are doing exactly what they should do with these sessions and with the opportunity to distribute and explain what is happening and see the actors in, in one in one in one in one thing uh, explainable for example explainable explainability was a characteristic of the expert systems of the 70s and the 80s and the researchers at that time said uh, if a, a computer cannot explain its behavior people will not will not trust it so it's not something new because human beings do not trust another human being that cannot explain why and how. So, but the problem with, with LLMs is that they are, uh, they are black boxes and due to the, its mathematical and computational nature. And finally, I would say that the responsibility of being explained by research organization and academic institution to help the citizens to understand what are the shortcomings what are they good for, and just fade away a little bit from Hollywood. Because sometimes people just get scared just because they think the world is going to come down to, <laughs> to something else like the Matrix, and it's not going to happen near soon. But at the same time, they have, we have to explain that you have to take some responsibility of what they do with AI. Because it's not only who develops, it's the one who uses it, and uses it well. That's it. Thank you, Victor. Yes, everybody needs to take responsibility for that. Um, Pamela, your concluding remarks and takeaways? Uh, thank you. What I would wish to say is uh, just reminding each other that AI is a global asset, so we should not look at it as a threat, but rather learn and work together to ensure that we enjoy the benefits so let's have uh, more discussion forums. Let's share our work and build the AI we want. Uh, the AI Code of Conduct or AI Convention is very, very important. Thank you. Thank you, Pamela. Yes, that is very important, building the AI we want. Um, Umut, your takeaways and any commitment to action? Well, uh, my invitation is not only to continue with these spaces or when we can have this kind of discussion and share of what is going on in our region on a, on a national level, but also to commit ourselves to share what we discuss inside of the internal governance spaces to our, govern our governments or to the final users of these kind of technologies. Because sometimes we are missing that kind of that aspect the 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 human aspect no in the use of these technologies we always talk about that we need to have a human centered ai where the human centered ai start for focusing in the users of these technologies thank you umut um jen if i could turn to you i know there's a comprehensive call to and commitment to action but your takeaways as well, well uh, I'm 
I, w I would like to stress that flexibility is, is, is a key <clears throat> because we, we don't know um, what applications will be there. We don't know what uh, practical risks there will be. <clears throat> so we, we really need uh, flexibility. And uh, to give you one example, explainability. We said <clears throat> in the discussion and, um, that flex uh, explainability is not really there. So you could either resort to some fake explainability, just some general explainability that does not explain the decision and that you are presented with, or you could look for some different um, mechanism that solves maybe at least a little bit of the, the problem. For example, you could give the system to the users and tell them, well, you can play around with it. You can see which parameter you need to change to get to a different decision. So you don't know really why the system has reacted, but you know what would have uh, needed to be different to get a different outcome. And I think this <clears throat> little example shows that we really need to be creative, need to look at flexibility, and we need to um, adjust regulation and the, the EU has been trying to be at the forefront of regulation and, and trying to <coughs> regulate technology before it's there. And this approach has uh, limits and we need to be flexible. We, we know we need regulation now, but we also know that we don't really know how the regulation needs to look like in 10 years. Thank you, Jean, for the reminder to be flexible. That is extremely important. Tanara, your concluding remarks and just main takeaway. Thank you, Jennifer. Uh, I, I also believe that discussions like these are really important for us to move forward to develop a community-driven governance for safe AI. In the last edition of the Brazilian IGF, this year, discussions on criteria for human review of automated decisions, the intersections between AI, privacy and data protection, digital so sovereignty, etc. Uh, we, we discuss all these issues uh, on the Brazilian IGF and also took place in Brazil this year, the Lusophon, Lusophon IGF. Yes, where we discussed uh, the, the implementations of the Portuguese language in AI models and data sets and vice versa. In this sense, we should commit to fostering more debates and actions, both within the Brazilian IGF community and among, among NRIs as a network. I think international cooperation are essential steps in ensure AI, inclus AI inclusivity. On a global scale, the trust uh, is really important. We need to trust in AI systems, but for that, it is necessary to know how they work, what they do, and what they don't do, and what we don't want they do. <laughs> <laughs> when discussing AI, we must ensure it's used to enhance our digital landscape responsibly with guidelines that prioritize human well-being and invo involve input from all stakeholders. Thank you so much. Thank you, thank you so much for that, especially the point on trust. I guess like that's the key and like you know what they don't want to do is also important. Um, adding to like some of your points itself is that like my final remarks would be like two important things or the takeaways that we have to do is that we need collaboration and coordination. When I talk about coordination, I think like there's a lot of coordination read needed at like you know a global level like various uh, entities have to come together who have an interest in like you know taking forward these conversations but like i think like the only interest that we need at this moment is like how they all come together so and like have a conversation and where that conversation starts and um, i guess like that's going to be very revolutionary and uh, second thing when i talk about collaborative i think like um, you know especially your point and also uh, somebody from online also mentioned 
um, is that collaborative in, is important that the public, uh, when I talk about public, is like how the government and the privates can come together, right? Like sometimes we have been talking a lot about the regulatory frameworks and et cetera and stuff where, le you know, legislations or rules and guidelines and et cetera, are like one way of looking at, you know, regulatory frameworks. But like how can also one of the mandates or like one of the ways, the you know, one of the principles of like the governments and like et cetera is to also ensure market works, right? So for that, like you can also use market mechanisms where as we move forward, like all of like, I guess like all of these conversations become fruitful if the, you know, the end stakeholders who are the developers and deployers use such, you know, frameworks. For that, I think there is a need for a buy-in from such stakeholders itself. I guess like one way of doing it is compliance, but that's a burden, especially for a technology which is like, you know, still evolving and like especially in the developing sec uh, developing countries. So we need to figure out a way in which like we make such governance frameworks are picked up by the market by themselves, right? Like where they start, start seeing a value proposition, a competitive advantage in doing, as you mentioned, the trust, right? <clears throat> trust could be one of the like, you know, aspects where like they start seeing that as a value proposition and maybe becoming a, using a responsible AI framework or such principles can bring trust. I think that link as like how we actually like show the pathways. Sometimes like when we talk about like regulations and like frameworks, it's always negatively connoted that like, you know, they are like going to bring burden and compliance. But I think the conversation or the, you know, the, uh, the nuance behind this has to be shifted such that we see this as like something that has to be picked up for your better in the, for, um, you know, uh, on the long run as well. So I guess like these are the, you know, the key takeaways. Thank you. Thank you so much, Kamesh. I think they have concluded much further than I can encapsulate, but I will uh, end with this. There is a need for trust. There is a need for flexibility in the regulatory frameworks and developing such things. And the most important part is the multi-stakeholder participation, both in designing this process and also implementation and actually deploying the use. So uh, thank you all for your time. Thank you to all of the NRI colleagues for giving us all of these best practices and good learnings. And um, thank you. <laughs>